I'm Jeroen van Mij and welcome to my lecture series on computer and network security. In this fourth and last video on secure network protocols, I will talk about Secure Shell or SSH. And Secure Shell or SSH was devised as a replacement for different remote login schemes such as Telnet, which allowed a user to remotely log into a server and execute commands, access files, and so on. Telnet was not secure and did not have any support for a confidentiality or message integrity, and so on. As such, SSH provides client-server confidentiality, integrity, and authentication for remote logon, remote command execution, file transfer, email, and so on. And let's take a look at the history timeline of SSH. The first version, SSH 1.0, was publicly released in 1995. In 1999, the first version of OpenSSH, which is a free software version implementation of SSH, was released. And in 2006, SSH 2.0 was standardized in different IETF RFCs. This version is considered superior and more secure than SSH 1.0. And just like TLS, SSH runs on top of the TCP IP protocol stack. However, in contrast to TLS, SSH is focused on remote logon and command execution. The SSH transport layer protocol provides server authentication, confidentiality and integrity, as well as optional compression. The SSH user authentication protocol authenticates the client to the server and the SSH connection protocol multiplexes the encrypted tunnel into several logical channels. And let's take a closer look at the SSH transport layer protocol. And before secure communication can occur, a handshake procedure is needed where the client and the server will negotiate which security algorithms to use, which version of SSH to use, and which security parameters such as keys to use. And the first step of this handshake procedure is the exchange of an identification string, which mentions the uh, software version as well as the SSH version that is being used. SSH supports a wide range of algorithms for confidentiality, message integrity, and compression. So during the handshake, which algorithms are used is negotiated. To do this, each side, so both the client and the server, send each other a list of algorithms they support ordered by preference. Then the first algorithm on the client list that is also supported by the server, so this is the one with the highest priority of the client that is supported by the server, is chosen. And here you can see an overview of some of the algorithms that are supported. Some are required, which means they have to be supported by every SSH implementation. Some are recommended, mm -hmm. which means they are highly recommended to be implemented. And then there are a set of optional ones. For uh, confidentiality, triple DES and AES 128, both with CBC mode, are required and recommended. For uh, message authentication, HMAC with SHA-1 um, is required and SHA-196 is recommended, while others such as HMAC with MD5 are optional. Finally, for compression, everything is optional and um, ZLIP, so ZIP, can be used for uh, to compress data blocks. The client and the server agree on a, a master key K using the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. I've explained Diffie-Hellman in previous videos, so I'm not going to go into details, but basically they generate random numbers, and based on those random numbers and their own public and private keys, they can both generate the same key K. The server then signs the key with its um, own private key to provide authentication. Using a certificate, the client can then authenticate that the server is indeed who they claim they are. The master key K is then used to generate symmetric keys and keys for message authentication using a pseudo-random function. 
As a final step in the handshake procedure, the client can send a service request where they either ask the server for user authentication, so allowing the client to also authenticate itself with the server, or to ask for the connection protocol to set up a connection and start transmitting data. And let's take a closer look at how the transport layer protocol of SSH processes packets. First, the application layer payload is optionally compressed. Then the compressed payload is turned into a fixed length block that is ready for encryption. This is done by adding padding and including the length of the padding as well as the length of the packet, which excludes the uh, packet length field and the MAC uh, field. Also, a sequence number is added, uh, which is initialized to zero and then incremented for each packet. The part without the sequence number is encrypted. So that means the sequence number is not part of the encrypted ciphertext of the SSH packet, but the sequence number is combined with the encrypted with the rest of the packet and um, message authentication code is calculated. As you can see, the message authentication code is not calculated on the encrypted payload, but on the plain text payload. Moreover, the message authentication code itself is not encrypted. This means that a different approach is used than in TLS, where we do MAC, then encrypt. So first calculate the MAC, then encrypt. Here we do them both at the same time, encrypt and MAC. This means that SSH is not vulnerable to the poodle attack because it follows a different um, method of encryption and message authentication. So now you know how the transport layer protocol of SSH works. Let's take a look at the other two protocols. And the first one is the user authentication protocol, which is an optional protocol that allows the client to also authenticate with the server because in the handshake only the server authenticates with the client. How does it work? First, the client sends an user authentication request, not specifying any method for user authentication. The client does include a username. If this username is invalid, the server sends a failure message and the authentication stops and has failed. If the username is valid, the server also sends a failure message, but states that authentication partially succeeded using the partial flag. In this message, the server will list possible methods that can be used for further authentication by the client. The client will then use one of these messages and send another request with the, message, uh, with the method they selected. If it is successful and the server requires more authentication, another partial failure message will be sent and the client can select another method and do more authentication. This uh, supports multi-factor authentication. Once the server is satisfied and the user has authenticated with enough methods, the server can send a user authentication success message to finalize the user authentication. The third and final protocol is the SSH connection protocol, which allows um, the client and server to open logical channels over a single secure authenticated SSH connection. That means the client and server can first negotiate and set up an SSH connection, which is also called a tunnel, and then open multiple logical sessions that use this connection for secure communication. And there are different types of channels that can be used with SSH. For example, a session, which is a channel that allows remote execution of programs and commands from the client to the server. There are X11 sessions, which allow remote graphical user interface forwarding using the X window system, which is used, for example, on Linux and can be used for remote desktop. Third type of session is a port forwarding session where secure TCP connections are converted into secure SSH connections. That means you can securely communicate across this SSH connection using it as a tunnel with an insecure TCP connection. 
An SSH port forwarding is one of the most useful features of SSH. In essence, it provides the ability to convert an insecure TCP connection into a secure SSH connection. This is referred to as SSH tunneling, and a port in this context refers to a TCP port, so the identifier of a TCP connection on a local host. When using TCP in an insecure way, the uh, client will bind on a local TCP port, for example, port X, and transmit data over the network using the TCP protocol. On the other hand, the server listens on a certain port Y and receives the data as the client specifies to which IP address and which port the data is destined. However, using SSH, we can intercept this traffic. We can create an SSH tunnel that binds on a local port X and a remote port Y and then forwards all the traffic that is transmitted to X towards Y and send it over a secure SSH con connection. And SSH supports two types of port forwarding, local forwarding and remote forwarding. In local port forwarding, the client can set up a hijacker process on its local computer that will intercept selected application level traffic and redirect it from an unsecure TCP connection to a secure SSH tunnel. So how does it work? Well, we configure SSH to listen on this local port, for example, port X. SSH will connect to a remote SSH server and forward all the data to that server. The server will then unpack that data from the secure SSH tunnel and transmit it over a regular TCP connection towards the configured remote host and port. So in OpenSSH, this can be done using the following command. We state that it's local port forwarding where traffic is intercepted on the local host on port X, sent to the SSH server where we log in with our username and then from the SSH server transmitted over regular TCP to a remote host on port Y. What can this be used for? For example, to securely send email to an SMTP server called SMTP serve on port 25, you can set up an SSH tunnel to an SSH server running on the same server that runs SMTP serve and send all your email traffic to localhost on a port that you decide, like for example, 2020. And then setting it up like this, all email, if you configure your email client to send email to this port, it will securely transmit that email over SSH to SMTP serve. With remote SSH port forwarding, the client will act on the server's behalf. The client will receive traffic with a given destination, IP address and port number, and will transmit that data over regular TCP towards that destination. You can perform remote for forwarding in um, OpenSSH using the dash R command, setting the port on the server that needs to, on which the SSA server needs to listen and intercept traffic on, and then the remote host and port to which the traffic needs to be forwarded by the client. It can be used, for example, to connect to, connect to the work intranet through a firewall um, from your home computer. The firewall will normally not accept connections directly to the work intranet on port 8080 from your home. However, by setting up remote port forwarding to an SSH server running in your home from an SSH client running on your work computer, you can locally browse to localhost on a pre-configured port, for example, 9000, and forward that traffic to your work intra at port 8080. If your firewall at work allows SSH connections, outgoing SSH connections,
then this will work and you can circumvent the firewall to browse your intranet from home. And to make sure everyone understands, I have a question about port forwarding. Let's say a user wants to connect to a database and the database runs on a remote host, DB host, on a port 5432. However, this remote host only allows connections to its database that originate from the local host for security reasons. Which OpenSSH command can you use to allow connecting to this database remotely? And here you see four possible SSH commands, two using local port forwarding and two using remote port forwarding. Another possible answer is that none of these commands will allow this. Feel free to pause the video if you want to think about the question. And let's take a look at the correct answer. And there are actually two correct answers depending on how you set up your SSH client and server. For example, answer B can be used if you set up an SSH server on the uh, server running the database, so DB host, and connect to it from your own computer, namely the remote host. Then you configure it that the um, incoming SSH data that you send to your local port 9000 is transmitted from the B host, so the SSH server, to local host on port 5432. Then any traffic forwarded through that SSH tunnel on the B host will look like it comes from the local host and thus allows you to connect to the database. Similarly, if you can set up an SSH connection from an SSH client running on the B host towards your own computer where the SSH server is running on remote host, you can use answer D to do remote port forwarding. And this question also concludes this video and also my lecture series on secure network protocols. Thank you for watching.